I don't know if you saw the headline Friday regarding the now newest Bible movie, The Young Messiah, is the title, and the issue right out of the gate with this film is diversity, or the lack thereof. And the opening line of the USA Today article says this, As another Jesus story is resurrected on the big screen, so is the potential for backlash over whitewashed casting. And they have British actor Adam Greaves Neal portraying a seven-year-old Jesus. And the article says, this film faces the same criticisms as Noah and Exodus, gods and kings, lack of diversity. And the producer said, hey, we wanted the best kids. And we put out casting calls. We looked at over 2,000 young people. Israel, Jordan, Italy, United Kingdom, Greece, Pakistan, other countries. And they made this choice. And I, I will say, I can... I see the complaint. You know, somebody's going to say 2,000 kids and you couldn't find one that maybe looks a little bit more Palestinian. You know, I mean, Jesus grew up in that country, Palestine. He's a Palestinian Jew. That's a fact. Let's take a white kid, grow his hair long, call him Palestinian. You know, that's, that's what we do. Long hair equals Bible character. That, that's how some people think. <clears throat> and I, I, see, I see the beef with that. But that's not my major complaint. Okay? I, I'm not as anxious to see the young Messiah as I was to see risen because there's not as much biblical text to use as a source. There's pretty much no text, if you're talking about Scripture, uh, to go on. And, and there are sources. There are other sources for movies like this to rely on, um, other narratives. But they were all excluded from the Bible for a reason some of them multiple reasons. We had a snippet that we shared on Wednesday night in our Islam class where Jesus makes these little clay birds and they come to life. Like, where, where do they get that? They get that from what's called the infancy gospel of Thomas. And we talk about that. It, the problem with that is it portrays a Jesus that's pretty much counter to everything that we know in the Bible. He's that little, I hate to say he's like a brat with power to kill kids that oppose him. And that, that's just, that's not the biblical Jesus. And personally, I'm never as concerned with the color of an actor's skin as I am the adherence to the scriptures. If you are going to make a Bible movie, please use the Bible. Would I prefer a Middle Eastern cast? Sure. But I would rather have a European cast that has accurate scripture over a Palestinian cast that has a fictitious script. I didn't bother to see Noah or Exodus, gods and kings. Uh, it wasn't because of the casting. It's because of the content. You're just making stuff up. You have unbiblical things that you add in there and it leads people astray. I'm not going to support that. And it got me thinking, all these movies, it got me thinking about this chapter, this current chapter that we just read in the story, which I trust you all know by now, just uses huge chunks of scripture. It is mostly word for word from the Bible. If you are going to make a movie out of this chapter 25, Jesus, the Son of God, who would be the lead? What kind of an individual is Jesus? And you can see from your outline that we're, we're going to interview some of the co-stars, some of the cast members, and we're going to see if we can't piece together who the lead is, and we're just going to have a running visual that's up here on the screen, and we'll start with, with this image and fill in the sections as we go. I understand it, it's obviously blank, and the first thing we'll fill in is the bottom, the backdrop, you know, uh, the sets. You do want somebody who is Palestinian. Okay. Um, ideally, you want somebody from Bethlehem. When that, that was part of the consternation in Jesus' day. They, they said, is this the guy? Could this be the one? And some people said, no, he, it's not him because this guy's from Nazareth. This guy's from Galilee up north. The Messiah has to come from Bethlehem, from the town of David. And, and you're probably sitting there going, yeah, but don't every Christian, when you read that Luke 2, don't we? So Joseph also went up to Judea, to Bethlehem, town of David, because he was a house and line of David. And Mary went with him, and Jesus was born there. And yes, Jesus is from Bethlehem. He fits the bill. And the Messiah certainly was anticipated or sought after or longed for. Uh, you have Simeon and Anna waiting for the prophecies to be fulfilled. All these other people. All sorts of Old Testament prophecies and predictions. And they come together and they form what was a very solid, rich 
backdrop for Jesus, and I understand even as this image is you know, somewhat plain at the moment, but we have had 24 chapters of the story to date. You go all the way back to page 6 of chapter 1 with Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he will strike your heel, you, know, you will strike your, his heel and he will crush your head. And it's a prediction, a prophecy of Jesus. And Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice. And Joseph forgiving and loving his brothers. And Moses leading people out of slavery. All of these foreshadows or or types, images of Jesus. Kings, prophets, predictions. It's all leading up to this point in the narrative. You have God's upper story. And it's constantly working in the lower stories of lives of people like us. Bringing us to the Savior. That's the question. Who will be our lead? So we ask around on set, see who's saying what, and the first person that we come to is Peter. Here's Peter. He's, he's like one of the co-stars, one of the main supporting roles. And, and you say, Peter, how would you sum up Jesus? And he goes, <laughs> sum up. <laughs> Explain. Right. You know, uh, let, let's, um, let's just start by saying he's, he's unpredictable. That's, that's what Peter would say. That, that's a good word. Peter would say, I'd never forget. There was one day, I was like the star pupil and the spawn of Satan all in the same day. And it, it's actually in Matthew 16, page 972. We have Matthew and John that we'll look at this morning. In Matthew 16, verse 13, <clears throat> when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And so others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, and goes on to appreciate Peter's statement, and they have a conversation about the rock and the church and the gates of hell. And right there in the same text, after he just appreciated him, not too much longer, look down in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter says, see what I mean? The guy is unpredictable. One minute this, the next minute, he's just hard to figure out. He says, there was this time we went up on, we go up on a mountain and Jesus is there and Moses and Elijah appear and here's these three great figures and it, the sun's burning down hot and I thought, let's do something. We'll make shelters for him and I'm even mid-sentence and the voice of God thunders and basically tells me to shut up you know, and says, listen to Jesus. He said, I can't tell you how many times Jesus would do something amazing and he'd gather us around and say, and he, and he, he put his shoulders, his hands on my shoulders, you know, like me specifically. He says, don't tell anybody. I, guys, I don't want to tell anybody. I say, see, that, that's what we're talking about. And I will venture that most of us in this room could sit down here right next to Peter and say, I know what you mean. Uh, if you've ever had a, a period or a season in your life when Jesus leading seems somewhat confusing, unexpected. We are driving down the road of life. Say, I did not see that curve or this cliff coming. Just when you think you have Jesus all figured out, he does something unexpected. And initially, when you're not used to it, it's nerve-wracking. But the more you learn to trust him and the more you understand that his leading is always for your better, then it just becomes more of an adventure. So we'll continue, and you're kind of moving around the set, and there's like a break room over here in the back, and you can hear there's a bunch of people in there. And you kind of poke in, there's a bunch of guys, and they're all gathered around the coffee pot, and they're kind of grumbling. And you can see from their garb that they are the religious leaders. And you say, fellas, what's your take on Jesus? And one guy goes, he's dangerous. You know, that's what he is. Somebody else says, he, he's demanding. He's defiant. He's destructive. And more and more, they're getting up now, and their voices are raising, and the pitch is louder, and you realize, uh, this is not acting. This is real life. 
This is how these guys really feel. And over in the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John eleven forty three, Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And what scene is that? And those who are familiar know this is raising Lazarus from the dead. And you can see down your list, we'll speak personally to Lazarus later. But if you have an NIV Bible or some of the Bibles that have like section headings, what happens immediately after that sentence is this heading, the plot to kill Jesus. John 11, verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And Caiaphas, the high priest, who thinks he's coming up with his own idea, doesn't realize he's really part of God's upper story. He has this suggestion, like Spock, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. That's what he says. One man needs to die for all of these people. And what does it say there next? Verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. That one line right there in the scripture is enough to tell you. That's what the majority of religious leaders think of Jesus. And not all of them. You have to be fair. There are some who followed him maybe a little bit secretly at the beginning, publicly at the end. Not all of them. But that's the majority leadership. That's their attitude. That's what they think of Jesus. Why? Because he never bows to their bullying. He doesn't keep his mouth shut. When they are in the wrong. He will turn over their tables. He'll toss coins because you're making a mockery. He is demanding. They are right. If you are not following scripture the way that the author intended, he's in your face. And the question, I guess, is so how does this guy garner such a following? He doesn't let everybody do as they please. It doesn't matter who it is. He will question you. He will call you out. You can ask Peter. You can ask the leaders. You can ask anybody. How does this guy amass such a following? It's because people appreciate courageous leadership. People follow conviction. How many times in this text does it say, people said, no one has ever spoken like this man. And he does it with authority. And and the football fans in the room are aware that Peyton Manning retired on Monday after a very long and successful career. And it's my understanding that Peyton Manning could be, at times, demanding. He prepared, he studied, and he expected everybody around him to do likewise. He served as another coach on the field. He would get on guys in the middle of a play if they weren't doing their job, losing focus. But he just won another Super Bowl, right, with the Denver Broncos. So guys are willing to follow his lead. Now, if you have watched this week unfold, what has happened? The Denver Broncos are leaking like a sieve. They called him the sheriff, and when the sheriff rode out of town, it seems like everybody's getting on their horse and abandoning. <laughs> and the sports commentators tell you it's all about the money. It's all, this happens every year. You have the championship team, and everybody else wants to poach a player off of there, and everybody follows the money. I don't know if does this have anything at all to do with Peyton and his departure. And everybody can argue, well, he wasn't the sharpest physically at the end, not by a long shot. It wasn't what he did physically. It's the intangibles in the huddle in the locker room, off the field, leadership, confidence. People who don't want to work, people who don't want to sacrifice, they find strong leaders to be demanding and divisive. But somebody that sees the goal, they understand the price that has to be paid. And I'm just saying that. If you're going to consider Jesus as a leader, these guys back here are right. He is demanding. You can ask them, you can ask Peter, you can ask anybody. If your choice is not according to Scripture, don't be surprised if he calls you out. Now we look over here, and coming through the parking lot is just a whole slew of extras. I hate to call people extras. You know, I know that's a term you use in movie. Link. Jesus doesn't see anybody as an extra. You know, so for a better term, we'll call them the crowd. Okay? And they're coming back here from this triumphal entry scene, and we say, what's your take on Jesus? They say, he is exalted. He is high and lifted up. And they're sharing some of their lines. Their scene is back in Matthew in chapter 21. And beginning with verse 6, and and understand, this is the calendar for next Sunday, our our 
physical calendar for Palm Sunday for the triumphal entry. Matthew 21, 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Shouting, crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he, Hosanna from Hebrew, which means save us. We pray. They are worshiping. They are following. They are loving. You all know this is part of the sermon where the preacher says we're all supposed to do that too. right? We are supposed to be exalting, lifting up. You are correct. But even being exalted or worthy of praise is not the whole picture of Jesus. Again, those people who have been a part of Wednesday night Bible study, I think we shared here in an illustration. Anytime the Muslim writes or speaks of Muhammad, what are those four letters? P-B-U-H. Peace be upon him. Every time they even mention his name in writing, those four letters in parentheses, P-B-U-H. Exaltation, lifting him up. You're aware of the warnings, even the threats that come your way if you ever dare to have a caricature or a cartoon of Muhammad. They exalt him. They lift him up. As Christians... We follow Jesus. We, we want, every, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We want everything we do to bring him honor and glory. But even that is not enough to completely say who Jesus is and why he is worthy. So we're going to come over here. We're going to sit down right here next to Lazarus. He of very pink and healthy skin. Uh, and he doesn't even notice that you're there. He's just sitting there staring at his hands and wiggling his toes running his fingers through his hair. And then he, he, oh, I'm sorry, what's your question? (laughs) Jesus, can you characterize Jesus? He says, powerful. He is all powerful. I don't know if you, can you imagine someone who's been called back from the other side of the grave, who has to come back here, and no, you know, you don't really want that to happen. You don't really want to have to be called back here. But if Jesus says it, You come back because he has that kind of power. And you remember how upset the leaders were. This is the same setting. You can't let somebody that has this kind of power live. And the timeline of the resurrection of Lazarus is noteworthy. You might be familiar. Jesus gets a message, says your friend Lazarus is sick. And the text says Jesus stays where he is for two more days. And then it takes two days to walk back to Bethlehem, to Bethany, Jerusalem area. And those four days are significant. You know, because Martha, the dead man's sister, is at the side of the tomb when Jesus arrives in John 11, in verse 39. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Four days dead matters. And last week you had, we had Jesus raising Jairus' daughter. If you remember that little 12-year-old girl, but she had just then died. Because even Jesus said, he said, figuratively, he said, she's not dead. She's asleep. She's sleeping. And, and they all laughed, the text says. They laughed because they knew she was dead. And he raised that girl from the dead. But you know how these stories go and evolve. And you know, I bet somebody said, maybe she was asleep. Maybe she was just, I don't know. Could it be? Not so with Lazarus. Four days. And I once read where the Jewish belief was the spirit of the departed would hover around the tomb for three days hoping for a reconnection. But by the fourth day, the body starts to decompose to the point that the spirit can't recognize, and they depart, and he is dead. So now you're sitting here interviewing a man who was four days dead, and you're trying not to be too consumed with your list or your issues or whatever's going on in your life, because now you have to come face to face with, he can do that. I know he can do this. And to be perfectly fair, even this power is not the complete picture of who Jesus is because there are other people who have done that. To, to be fair, there are other people in history who, ha- aren't there? And if, you, if you could interview the old timers, you know, the, the 
silent movie guys, the black and white guys, anybody that was in the films in like first and second Kings, they would say, yeah, I, I worked on the set with this guy, Elijah, and he raised people from the dead, didn't he? He, he raised that one widow's kid. And they said, yeah, and he taught his protege, Elisha, did the same thing. He raised that other lady's child from the dead. And he, Elisha, <laughs> Elisha was raising people from the dead after he died. If you remember that, there's a sit that he's buried and he's in the tomb and there are some people who are burying their friend and they look over in the distance and some raiders are coming. Some Moabite raiders are coming your way. This is a bad scene. They say, we got to rush. So they scoop up the body and they throw it in the tomb where Elisha's bones are. And as soon as the body touches his bones, that guy comes back to life and jumps out of the tomb and runs off with his friends. Second Kings 13, 21. So we just cut to the chase. Let's stand next to the Lord. Jesus, who are you? And his answer will be what? I am God. Specifically, his answer will be, I am. Made Denise and I think of Mark Schultz. I am, the song. I am the maker of the heavens. I am the bright and morning star. I am the breath of all creation who always was and is to come. I am the one who walked on water. I am the one who calmed the seas. I am the miracles and wonders. So come and see and follow me and you will know. I am the fount of living water. The risen son of man. The healer of the broken. And when you cry, I am your savior and redeemer. Who bore the sins of man. The author and perfecter beginning and the end. I am. He is. Come back next week. The week after. We will watch him die, go to the cross, take our sins, save us. We'll see him raised in victory, rising over death. He is God. And he, he states this in such a way in the Gospels as to leave no doubt. Back in John chapter 8, Jesus speaking in verse 56, John eight fifty six, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. I am. I am. Two words. You have two words and an entire crowd wants to kill somebody for two words? It's not just any two words, okay? Ironically, I looked it up. This construct, I am, appears in the Bible 2,931 times. Why is this one so incendiary? Because nothing follows am. If Jesus says, I am hungry, I am tired, I am sick of you being so stupid, you know, that, all of that, that's not a big deal. But for him to simply say, I am Every Jew knows what that claim is, what that means. You go back to Moses and the burning bush in Exodus 3, and it says, Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What do I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's more than a statement. It's a name. It's the divine name. It's the name of God. God said it. They understood it. Jesus has claimed it. That's why they want to stone him. Because he says, I'm God. And obviously that's the final, that's the most significant piece of the puzzle. Jesus says, I am God. All the interviews, all the miracles, all the prophecies, all the pieces of the puzzle... The creator himself stands in the midst of this lower story. He says, here's all the evidence. I am God. And if that's the truth, and it is, the power has to change hands. Jesus is God. Am I going to accept that? I always love what C.S. Lewis said, the famous quote, liar, lunatic, or Lord. Those are your choices for Jesus. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. 
<clears throat> but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. What is your choice? Because this choice changes everything. Now, now all of a sudden, it's not you and I walking around on the set of our life trying to decide if we're going to give Jesus a part. <laughs> trying to look at the script and, and figure out if I'm going to let him be, a lot of people let him be the supporting actor in a tragic scene. Now, see, he has to be the lead. In every scene, on any set, he has to be the lead. He has to be the Lord. He is God. You don't hand him your script. He wrote the script. He has to be the author, the producer, the director of our lives. Far, far, far too many people waste too much of their lives trying to dictate to Jesus what role they're going to let him play. The far better question to ask the God and the Savior of the world is what role would you have me play? Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we are aware of who Jesus is and we are aware of the role that we are asked to play. And far too often we believe that we're in charge of everything. Father, we thank you for who Jesus Christ is, for what he has demonstrated, promised, and offered. And we pray that we will be wise enough to take advantage of that offer while time remains. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And we always encourage you, we always provide an opportunity. There is no better use of this time here this point than for you to say, I understand the offer that is before me, and I need to take advantage of uh, let's stand together and we sing this presentation. 504 of the album.
in a spot where any parents could give me help transportation, adults or parents, transporting kids to the barn next Sunday, and my phone number's on there. Call me if you have any questions or talk to me after church. Very good. High school, middle school? Uh, should be a pretty normal part of scheduling week. Of life. Normal teenage week. <laughs> <laughs> Close this morning by singing Jesus in the name of the Lord.